Hi, my name is Steve Brown, and I'm the CEO and founder of Orcadian Energy. So Orcadian Energy is probably a new name to you. We came to the market in July of this year in the AIM market in London. And we came to the market actually with 79 million barrels of proven and probable reserves certified by SPRU, which it turns out is actually the biggest UKCS focused oil and gas IPO on AIM ever, if you measure it by 2P reserves, which is kind of special, I think. And uh, our reserves are in um, a license 150 kilometers due east of Aberdeen uh, in actually relatively shallow water for the North Sea, 80 meters of water, which is great because our rigs are half the cost of the rigs you'd need in the northern North Sea. Uh, and we have a discovery that was made back in the um, 80s by FINA. When it was discovered, people thought this is a fantastic reservoir, absolutely fantastic reservoir, but the oil was a bit viscous. So it sat undeveloped for years, and we've come up with a plan to develop it using polymer flooding. And what polymer flooding does for you is it transforms a long, slow production process into eight to 10 years. And you get better recovery, much less time. And if you polymer flood viscous oil, you've got much less emissions. And it turns out that almost the most important thing for getting a project off the ground in the North Sea at the minute is your emissions performance. Well, let's, let's talk about that. Steve, lovely to meet you, a fellow countryman, ambassador for the country, like me. Um, and we're going we're gonna to talk about your project. So it's a, big, it's, a, it's a big project out of the gate. You listed in July this year, but you've been at it since 2014, haven't you? Yes, absolutely. We set the company up in 2014. And the, the whole idea we had uh, was to lay our hands on big discovered oil and gas fields for the lowest cost possible. How'd you and do it? You How'd you do it? You make license applications. So, and what you do is you sit and you read every relinquishment report that was ever published in the North Sea. So when I decided to set the company up, that was the first thing I did. And when I, my eyes lighted on the pilot field, which is the name of the field we have, I said, this is the same field as Harding. It's just the oil's a bit more viscous. And why is Harding relevant? So Harding was the field that I worked on in BP when I led the pre-project team, put the development plan together for Harding. Uh, it was BP's first viscous oil development in the North Sea. It was their first all horizontal well development. Uh, it's produced 300 million barrels. It's been a massive success for BP. And when I saw Pilot, it's the same depositional environment. It's a Tay sand. Harding's bolder. They're both Eocene sands, young sands, not very deep, and uh, horizontal wells were the right answer. You need to add something to it to, to get the oil out of pilot because it's a bit more viscous, and that's something turns out to be polymer. We originally thought it was steam, and that wasn't a bad idea. It just wasn't the best idea. So it just, it just helped me understand this in, in, in language people might understand. So in terms of API, viscosity is what? Yeah, so... Our, the API gravity ranges from about 12 API in the north of the field to about 17 API. Right, in the so quite low, right. On average, it's 13, 14 API. It's very similar to Kraken crude, which is producing field that Enquest are producing at the moment. It's, it's similar in terms of API gravity. Um, we're a little colder than um, Kraken. It's because we're just a bit shallower, so its viscosity is a bit higher. So we're 160 centipoys in the south and maybe 1,200 centipoys in the north. And you're probably, some of your audience are saying, what's this centipoys stuff? Uh, so one is water, 10 to the power two, 10, or 10, 10 is blood, 100 is olive oil, 1,000 is engine oil. So this stuff flows. It's not... It's not tar or anything like that. It flows pretty well. And one of the great things is, you know, other people have invested a huge amount of money in these fields. 
So probably $150 million were spent appraising the fields. And in the north of the fields, there's a short horizontal well that did 1,800 barrels a day. Okay, let, let me before we before we kind of get stuck into the detail. I want I want to I want building blocks here. Okay, um, so the the plan is you go and look at um, well, effectively ab abandoned fields, right? No, not abandoned fields. No? I don't like you don't like that <laughs> word. Okay, sorry. What was the word you used? Unde undeveloped. Undeveloped. Okay, so they they, they they've been Look, undeveloped. Fields are a whole tricky game because you're trying to be smarter than someone who spent. 20 years producing. Them. Got it. Okay, that's a meaningful difference. No, thank you for the correction. Okay. And you have gone and obviously you've got pilot there, but um, how many of these have you assembled? How many of these? So uh, our core field is pilot. That's got 79 million barrels of 2P. We've got uh, another discovery called Blakeney that's got 25. And then another pair of discoveries called LK and Narwhal that have uh, 53. And those, those discoveries are 2C contingent resources. We've also got some exploration prospects. And so, you know, there, there's potential to produce 250 million barrels from this acreage. There is. And, but, and what I'm kind of trying to get from you today is actually um, your strategy for doing so, because you're 24 million, 25 million market cap companies, depending on the time of day. You've got to fund all of this, and these are separate fields. You're not managing the same field. It's 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 going to be slightly more complicated. One suspects, but that you've probably got a process to do that. Before you do that, you dropped in the fact that you're XBP. Can you just talk through the team? I want to understand who we're working with here. Who could we be investing with? What's the what's the track record? So um, I'll start with my non-execs because uh, they're actually really impressive. <laughs> Are they active non-execs though? Yes. Right. Yes. So. Um, uh, Joe Darby is our chairman. Joe used to be the chief executive of Blasmo. He was an um, independent non-exec on Premier's board for 10 years. So he's got a great track record, and he's an engineer. He's an engineer like me. Uh, then we have another technically focused non-exec, um, Christian Wilms. Uh, and actually, he's a bit younger than me. He did 20 years with Shell. Uh, and recently moved to become Senior Vice President Subsurface and Reservoir Development for MOL, the Hungarian oil company. Uh, and then we have Tim Feather, who's in a pre previously was a qualified executive working at WH Ireland. So he brings the kind of aim background. My CFO is Alan Hume. He's worked for, it's an interesting mix. He's worked for contractors like Halliburton and Brown and Root and so on. And he's worked for small oil companies, listed the name. So that's a good good background. Uh, key technical person, who's the other director, is Greg Harding. And he's a reservoir engineer. Um, uh, and he and I have worked together since uh, 96, I think, um, on a number of projects. We're, we actually make a very good double act. So he's very rigorous and quite creative. The two of us together come up with solutions that work. Right. Okay. So there's the team. There's the team that you've assembled um, for this. Um, you've decided to go from private to public recently after yeah. seven years of, of assembling those packages. Uh, why? Why put yourself through that, Steve? <laughs> why put myself through that? It's a very good question. Uh, I mean, there's a limit to what you can do in the oil and gas business with limited resources, right? So I set the company up in March 2014. We applied for the pilot license. We then applied for some other licenses and we were progressing the project through um, a number of hurdles that you have to get through. You know, we, we took our core license from the initial term into the second term, which is, it's a big deal, actually. Normally, the only way you can do that is by drilling uh, a well, that's that's the standard term. But we actually persuaded the Oil and Gas Authority that we had a very interesting development plan and were able to take it into the second term without having to make that expenditure. We did have to spend money, of course, but not, not 10 million pounds to drill a well. Uh, the next stage of our development, we need a serious amount of capital. And uh, 
you know, we talk, we talk to private equity people. Uh, I understand private equity people pretty well. What they like to do in the oil and gas space is buy production and do financial engineering. I know. That, that used to be me. Uh, yeah. so, but so, it doesn't so help you. <laughs> engineering. So let, let's, let's uh, no, I totally understand that. It's literally the job I used to do. Um, talk, talk to me a little bit about, before before we get into that, about the private phase. It's like, so you guys, how much money did you have to put into the into this yourselves? How much did you have to raise? How much, what was the total amount of, of capital deployed? So, you know, it's only a few million pounds that went into the company. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time working for the company without taking any salary or what. So we put what money we had and all our effort into creating this company. What actually got us really off the ground was in the middle of 2019 when we secured a loan from the shell traders. So the the shell traders, um, like our crude, it's an interesting crude. It's a it's a low sulfur heavy crude, and that that occupies a nice niche um, uh, that's attractive to them. So in return for us committing some of our marketing, our barrels to them for them to market in the future, they loaned us a million dollars. So not a lot of money, but we could do a lot with it. And what we did is we dove into the concept select process that the Oil and Gas Authority has for approving developments. And actually, when we started that process, we were still thinking we might do a steam flood. But we realized right at the outset of it that actually we could make more money doing a polymer flood. And we invested in delivering a concept select report to the OGA based on a polymer flood. We did that in September 2020. And it was just at the time that the Oil and Gas Authority was beginning to adopt meeting a net zero objective alongside maximizing economic recovery. And how, just how important is this? Because we're, we're seeing it bandied around and there's greenification going everywhere. Your front page of your PowerPoint is net zero basin. Now, are you just using that language because that's what they need to hear? Or with the, with the polymer solution, does that genuinely deliver against that? And if so, in, in what ways? Right. So. Um, it's, it's just crystal clear to me that if you don't have, if you haven't minimized your emissions to the lowest level possible, you're just not going to get through the door with the oil and gas authority. They, this is just as important to them as maximizing economic recovery. So, well, you know, this even, for, even for small companies, I can understand for the big guys, but even for small companies. They, they don't want new developments that have high emissions per barrel. So um, compared to a typical viscous oil water flood, um, polymer flooding roughly halves emissions. And the reason for that is that you shorten the field life and you reduce the fluid handling. And it's the fluid handling that uses energy and that's what causes emissions. But so adopting polymer flood did a lot of things for it. It helped our recovery factor significantly. It shortened the field life. It reduces fluid handling. You get the oil quicker. It's a big win. Explain it. I, I, I guess the clue's in, in the name, polymer, but ex explain technically why, why it's more efficient. So, so it's all to do with mobility ratios. Right. right. So if you imagine the oil and the rock, it's quite viscous. And if you put in a really uh, thin water, fluid like water, it fingers through the oil and actually it leaves most of it behind. And you, to get a decent recovery with the viscous oil, you've got to cycle around pour volume after pour volume after pour volume through the reservoir. And then you can get most of the oil. If you do a polymer flood, that viscosifies the water. So you, you add about a quarter of a percent of polymer to the water. That takes it from one center poise up to about 25. And the cost of that? So it costs you, um, in terms of water you inject, somewhere between 
66 euro cents okay. and 190 euro cents. Okay. No, the only reason I ask is because some, sometimes some of the solutions for some of the, the heavier or the low API uh, products is that you, I'd rather be investing in the company uh, that was supplying the polymer because the margins are huge. But in this case, it seems reasonable. Yeah, I mean, in terms of production, it's around about three or four dollars a barrel. Right. Perfect. Okay. Know, it's not. It's not a trivial cost. No. You know, um, but it, it's not. It's not massive. And if you short on the field life and you get twenty five percent more oil, or thirty three percent more oil, that's well worth doing. It's not killing your net back. Is is where I was going with it? Because again, we've had so much innovation in this space, much of it not proven, which kind of distorts the economics. So, okay, understood. So, in, in terms of. Um, Costs the MPV 10 break even yeah. for the pilot project is $39 a barrel. Yeah, so that so at, today, at today's price, I mean, I don't even bother calculating the MPV at today's price. It's you know, it, the way you make a project work is you focus on the proven case and you focus on a downside price because that's all a banker will look at. Yeah, but I, t I tell you, at the same time, if you were coming in asking me, I know you put an MPV 10 on it, I, we'd put an MPV 40 on it just to make sure it really stacks up. So at 39 bucks, it's it's not too shabby. It's it's, it's there. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a viable project. And and Sproul wouldn't have called it reserves. It didn't meet all their criteria to call it reserves. And one of those is that it's it's an economic project. Another is that it's likely to get financing. You know, read SPE, PRMS 2018. That's one of the criteria. So reserve auditors are, aren't bankers, but they know the space. And they certainly think this is a project that's likely to get financed. So I was explaining how... The, um, this, yeah. Yeah. So you, you viscosify the water. And what, what ends up happening is you get a stable flood front. So you get a piston-like displacement of the oil out of the reservoir. And that's why you shorten the field life, reduce the fluid handling, and that reduces emissions. But what happened to us in September 20 was the OGA said, we really like your plan, but we want you to do better on emissions. So in parallel with running our listing process, we went back and redid our concept select evaluation and we did a couple of things. So one was we put heat pumps into the process. And the other was that we selected much more efficient power generation systems. Those two things together have emissions. And then we added a floating wind turbine and that have emissions again. So we're down, we're projecting 2.6 kilograms of CO2 per barrel, which is an eighth of the North Sea average in 2018. And it's we've halved emissions because of polymer, we have because of process ingenuity, and we've halved because of using renewable energy. And you're hoping that's going to make the money that is available to you cheaper? I don't think the oil and, money in the oil and gas space is cheap. <laughs> <laughs> cheaper, <laughs> cheaper. What, what I think is it makes the project investable for... For the government to approve it in the first instance, because if we hadn't done those things, they'd just keep saying, do better, do better. Um, but it also opens the door to investors who, who kind of recognize we've got to put some more money into oil and gas. Well, well th that's an interesting concept because um, I was talking to a miner the other day and they were talking about their own net zero carbon initiatives, which are not insignificant. They're saying that there's a new capital pool available to them who would not previously have thought about uh, investing in mining because of this net zero carbon component. Um, and obviously, we, we, I think we're both talking about the narrative at the moment, people are moving away from fossil fuels, certainly the big funds wanting to move away from coal, from from oil, uh, et cetera. It, it, it means that the, the type of money is changing, and the, the, the groups involved are changing, the structures are changing. And I just, yeah, I mean, if you start sort of sharing with us what you think is happening in the oil and gas space in terms of the, the participants in the funding, as far as funding concerned is. So, so you know, um, we have a very interesting project and we we got two ways that we can take this forward. One, one is 
you know, we put together a consortium of contractors and we look for some equity contribution from some of those possibly, but they never do very much. You know, it's, you, you've got to have limited ambition and what you're expecting from them. You put together a debt package and then we raise some equity in the market. But, th- but those guys are coming off a very tough uh, f- few years as well. So in terms of their capital reserves have been drained somewhat. Their access to capital has drained somewhat. So they're not necessarily there. And this is what I'm getting at is like, where do you start looking? Who do you turn to? So they can do some, but don't, don't expect too much. Uh, you can raise debt for development financing. That is absolutely possible. We're t- we've talked to a number of banks about that. We've got a sense of, you know, you ought to be able to raise roughly 60% of your capital in. So it hasn't changed. Okay. That, that sort of tranche of money. And you know, some of that might get allocated to the FPSO contractor. Some of it will get allocated to um, the parts of the project we would execute. Um, and there are people who will do some mezzanine financing. That's an option. And then the, the final option is equity. And there's two places to get equity. One is the markets, which is why it's important to be in the market and tell our story and get people interested. But there's also oil and gas companies. So, you know, we'd be very interested to see non-operating partners come in. If an operating partner wants to come in and take over from us, as long as they're doing the right thing, I'm happy for them to do that. But um, there's really two sources of equity. One is the market. One is the industry. Right. And we, we keep talking to both. And, you know, one of the characteristics of our company that is very different from most of the companies you talk to is the management own an awful lot of the company. How much? Uh, so 66% um, is what's... And then my children have some as well. Okay. So, so you, hang on. So, so at some point, liquidity is going to become your problem unless you do start raising raising money. Um, so, so I want to move this from a theory through to deliverables. Okay. Because 25 million market cap company, there's the theory of, well, I don't want to be disparaging, the polymer flooding solution where you're talking about bringing timelines down, which I guess has lots of advantages and a, and a few negative ones too. Um, th- where's that data from? Because you've not gone and done that. Have you been testing in your field or are you using generic data? So we haven't done a pilot scheme on pilot, right? You've got to change that name. It's very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> it's named after the wheel. I like the wheel. So, you know, I keep... <laughs> okay. anyway. We haven't done a pilot scheme. Mm-hmm. If you're onshore, that's what you do. Because what's the big deal? You're drilling a well pair. You knock them down. You see how it goes. Doing that offshore is really difficult. You have to spend a lot of capital to put equipment out there. So we rely on two things. One is analogs. And the other is actually core flood tests. So let me talk about the analogs first. Um, we have an excellent analog right here in the North Sea called the Captain Field, which was originally developed by Chevron as a water flood. And it was on that cycle of cycling lots of poor volumes of water around the reservoir to get the oil out. They implemented, they did a trial because it was easy for them to drill a pair of wells from the platforms. It worked really well. So on the trial that they did, They had a well pair 125 metres apart, quite long horizontal wells. Uh, They started off with a bit of a water flood. They got some recovery. And then they projected how the water flood would go. And Chevron knew how Captain would work. So they said, you know, you'll recover this amount in seven years or so. They did 12 months of polymer flood. They recovered all that oil. Another 18 months, they'd recovered a 15% extra uplift on the recovery fund. So that was... That was the evidence that Chevron used to sanction uh, the polymer flood project on Captain. And I think her, the new operator of Captain, have just sanctioned phase two of that. So it turns out Captain is a really good analog to our field. So that's a good honor in the sense that the viscosity component is the same? No, they're a bit lower viscosity than ours. Okay. 
Well, ev- everything else is the same. So it's the same temperature, it's the same porosity. Same right. Good environment. But the viscosity is a bit different. So we would we would aim for a slightly more viscous water. Yep. Compensate for that. Okay. And what we've also done is we've taken some core samples. You know, the, the rocks actually really unconsolidated. So they kind of went more as a, as a bag of core. Um, and we had Ultimate EOR, EOR, who are based in Austin, Texas, do some core floods uh, on that. And they've really confirmed to us that pilots have perfect reservoir to polymer flood. Okay. Brilliant. And then um, next is you've got to, you've then got to go and work out the order of play, as it were. You've got to work at, you, again, I come back to work, the value of the company today versus the money that you can raise. You know, I don't think that's changed since when I, when I was funding companies like you, is you can only raise a certain amount now. You can do some work and, and you know, and go through the phases, as it were, using r- r- rugby terminology here. So, what is the plan? What is the strategy from going from where you are now using this uh, analysis technology on what, and, and on what, which one of your, of your fields are you going to be focused on? Just pilot. Pilot is the core. Right. Okay. Number one. Uh, so why is it the core? It's, it's because it's really well appraised. We don't need to spend any more money appraising it. It's got seven reservoir penetrations. It's got fantastic 3D seismic over it. We've just bought some new 3D seismic. So in terms of defining the reservoir envelope and the oil in place, we've got fantastic data. Um, We've put together a a development plan. We've submitted that to the OGA. We have then enhanced that by reducing emissions, did a further submission. And now what we're doing is we've recently gone out to the market for an FPSO. So an FPSO is a floating production storage and offloading vessel. Um, And... You know, if you look at the capital that's needed to get the project into production, it's roughly a billion dollars. About 600 of that is at AFPSO. Now, here's the thing. The best people to convert vessels and turn them into FPSOs are FPSO contractors, not oil companies. They're much better at executing those projects. So we go out to the market. There's four companies that operate in the North Sea with FPSOs, and three of them have come back to us with really good proposals, expressions of interest in working on the project. What does, what does that look like generically? I appreciate that maybe sensitive information at this time during a bidding process, but what does that roughly look like? Because you're talking a big ticket item there, which clearly yeah. you're not going to fund all of. So how does that work? There's a range of ways things happen. So the FPSO business, the standard way it happens is that the FPSO contractor um, agrees the scope of work that's needed, agrees what the FPSO looks like or is going to look like with the operator. They get a commitment to lease that over a period of time. And then they look for a guarantee from the operator that they will pay that lease. And then they go to the debt markets and raise debt and put some equity in and build the FPSO. That, That doesn't work with us because you know, I would give a guarantee, but it wouldn't mean anything. The only guarantee that would mean something from us would be a cash collateralized guarantee. So actually what's possibly more likely to happen is that there is an equity contribution from the FPSO provider, certainly in the form of the base vessel they'd use and maybe some equity they'd put in. And obviously the more equity an FPSO provider puts in, the more I'm thinking they could be the one, you know, uh, it's more likely we'll put a capital contribution into the conversion of the vessel. That's exactly what Hurricane did on the Lancaster development with an FPSO provider. Um, so it, these are complex deals to put together. They don't fall together in 10 minutes. No, good. Well, the, the, well, you're talking about a lot of money and there's going to be a lot of players involved and a negotiation of certainly around security um, you know, as, as, as a major component of that because not everyone wants to just inherit an oil field because that's also liability as well as an asset in, in that sense. So who, who are the other players that you'd need to bring to the table once you've got the FPSO um, sort of broadly in line? 
so the FPSO is a specialist piece of business and we're, we're working on that and we're, we're working on it with actually probably the best consultancy on that, in that side of the business. Um, there's three, four lumps of capital that we then need to find. So, so one is um, the mooring installation and the infield flow lines. Uh, one is a wellhead platform. The third one is the first five wells. It's a 32 well drilling program, but we'll start production with just five. And then the fourth item is a floating wind turbine. And there's lots of opportunities to lease that. And there's a lot of money keen to invest in that sector. So I'm kind of less worried about that. The wells are really interesting. Uh, because we, we've got a 32 well drilling program. Oh, well, sorry, what, what's the depth again? How shallow are we? 2,700 feet. Okay. It's pretty shallow. Yeah, okay. I, you know, you, you, you knock them, they're about $15 million wells, roughly speaking. They're not that expensive. Um, but no one else has a 32 well drilling program looking for a rig and looking for a service provider. And what we're planning to do probably in the new year is go out to the the rig contractors and the well service contractors, which essentially is Halliburton, Baker Hughes and Slumberjay, and look for which one of those is most enamored of our project to help us finance the first five wells, because we can pay for all the other wells out of cash flow. And, you know, that way we bring in contractors who are partners as well as um, uh people doing work for us. So how, how does a company of your size go about retaining control? Because what, what you are is kind of a, a, a lead in a consortium of companies with their various balance sheets, you know, which are unconnected, uncorrelated balance sheets, as it were, um, To because you've had the idea, you've put the team together and said, right, here's how we go about it. You're public, obviously, and some of them may be and some of them won't be. Um, how do you retain control and not get edged out or have your margins uh, attacked or abused um, during this whole process? Because your balance sheet is presumably going to be one of the smaller ones in that consortium. Well, fundamentally, what protects us is we have the license. So nobody's doing this project unless we say so. Uh, and, you know, what you do to protect your margins is have competitive processes to select the partners. So with the FPSO, you know, we've gone out to four or five companies that might be have been interested in that. We've got three companies very interested. We're going to run another bit of a competitive process to narrow down who we're going to work with. And, you know, then you go into the detailed engineering phase. Uh, and then you need to have structured your deal with the FPSO contractor so that, yeah, if you find during the engineering phase that costs have gone up, there's a, me there's a mechanism to handle that. But you're both trying to find ways to get costs down because you both know that makes it more likely the project goes ahead. So it, there's a time for competitive tension. There's a time for partnering. And picking those times is half the art. And well, and the other secret is uh, the paperwork, right? Because in a, in a way, you've got to be careful you don't end up with the least aware, i.e. the person who is, gives you as vanilla an agreement as possible, i.e. you've got opt-outs and, and, and uh, reason not to pay penalties yourself, versus the most competent who probably will want those um, conditional um, components in a contract, right? <clears throat> so you've got to get that balance between right getting the best versus maybe not penalizing yourself in an eventuality which may or may not happen further down the line. So the, the thing is the companies we're dealing with are grown-up country companies and they, they understand that we're a small company. But that's my point. Out. That's my point, Steve. <laughs> 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 they understand it. And I've I've been all too aware and I've been in you know in the oil and gas energy space for a long time and I've and I've seen all sorts of shenanigans here. It's like you've got to protect yourself and your shareholders because you're a public company now, right? Absolutely. Well, absolutely. And I mean, this, this is, 
one of the ways you do this is that you add capability by working with consultants and contractors who are kind of really part of our team. So the relationship we have with Crondall is a very interesting one, really, as an example of that. So, so Crondall have been in the FPSO market forever. Um, since I worked with Duncan Peace back in Halliburton in 1996, we worked together there. He went off to set up Crondall and they've been the uh, technical advisor to many banks on FPSO construction contracts. What they did for Hurricane on Lancaster was it was really them that negotiated the contract with Blue Water for the FPSO. It was actually them that put the FPSO delivery manager into the project team. So by partnering with Crondall and them working as our client engineer, we're getting not just engineering capability, we're getting commercial capability. Uh, you know, you need lawyers at a certain point, but a lot more is about uh, structuring the commercial arrangements than it is just the legals. Yeah, understood. Understood. I think that thing that, that pay- and for the well construction, we use Petrofac as our well operator. Got it. Okay. Understood. So I, I'm, I make myself strong by standing on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> Always good advice. Always good advice. And um, right. So, so just, just so kind of moving forward in terms of trying to understand the timeline of all of these things that need, need to happen for you. Obviously, we're coming towards the end of the year. Uh, you're, you're not even six months into being a public company. Um, well, for, let me just ask, how are you enjoying that process? Reporting every which way <laughs> about everything, always. Uh, I've done it before, so it's, it's okay. not really fresh to me, and I knew what I was getting into. Uh, but, you know, it's a pain in the backside. Of course it is. <laughs> of course it is, and it's expensive. Uh, that you get double whammy. Um, so let, let let's look into 2020, 2022, Okay, in terms of what you think you're you're reasonably going to be able to deliver in that time frame, because negotiating with multiple uh, partners um, to build this consortium, it, it it can it can take time. Uh, how advanced are you with those conversations, or is that not something that you're looking at doing in twenty twenty two? I mean, we, what, what we're always doing is looking to bring partners into the project because that could be a really good way forward and what i never do is tell people what a timeline is because i've done this before and i know whatever deadline you set turns out to be wrong so don't set deadlines you know this will take as long as it takes it's as long as a piece of string and it's highly likely we'll bring a partner into the project before we sanction it you know, Hurricane did Lancaster 100% without bringing a partner in. Um, I think the bankers, the invest, they like to see some industry validation that what you're doing actually makes sense. So at some point, we'll, we'll do that, and it will happen when it happens. Um, you know, our plan, is we're heading towards final field development plan approval, probably the end of next year, maybe early the year after. Who knows, you know, we won't have FDP approval until the project's financed. That's that's just how it works. You don't, the, the government doesn't let you do a project unless you've got the money. Okay, well, well let's, let's talk about the money you're gonna need for next year. If, if, that's, if that's how long that's gonna say, end of next year, maybe Q1, 23. Um, how much money do you need to deliver all of the, I, I, I guess there's a lot of paperwork which needs to be between now and then, then there's a few consultancy, consultants that need to be paid between now and then. Are you looking, how much cash have you got? When are you looking to raise next and how much? So, so um, our results are due up fairly soon and we'll say exactly how much cash we'll have got it. when we come. How much did you have last quarter? Uh, well, we raised three million pounds at the IPO and we had fairly chunky costs at the IPO. So, you know, we're not swimming in cash, but we also, we don't spend much. We're very focused and we're very parsimonious about how we spend the cash. So we give ourselves a runway and whenever we see an opportunity to secure cash, and there's multiple ways to get cash, you know, you can go to the market and raise some money. Uh, You know, we might potentially extend the loan arrangements we have with Shell, that's a possibility. Uh, And um, we might, bring a non-operating partner in and have them carry us through a piece of a work program. 
you know, the FPSO, when we get to the point of actually doing the feed, the front end engineering design of that, that's a fairly chunky bill. That's maybe $5 million or $6 million or four, you know, that sort of order of magnitude. But you can get a lot of things done for not massive expenditures. And we're, you know, we just take things carefully. We commit to things whenever we're able to. And um, we're, we're, we're always making progress. Okay, well, I guess that's what you can do. So um, you'll get the quarterly out seen. People that understand the state of play uh, as to where you are with cash, um, you will have to give some kind of guidance as to what your expectations of cash demand or cash burn will be for 2022. And you will, I guess, let us know whether you're going to raise that on a quarterly basis, buy a, 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 you know, you know, every six months annual, but what, what, however you're going to go and raise that capital will be interesting to us because it, it, it starts, this is where the public stuff comes a pain in the ass, as you quite correctly described it, which is, you know, people are going to be worried about dilution, right? What's that going to do for my share price? I bought in at whatever they bought in at, and you're going to borrow money because that's the nature of the beast because you're ways away from generating, um, uh, revenue, but you've you've got to deliver the growth stories, and the growth stories are going to be hampered slightly by have I got my license? You know, have I got my, all the permits I need to do what I need to do? So that's the journey. We can see a very clear pathway to getting all those permits. You know, the um, the, the oil and gas authority have, have actually got quite structured process to go through, and we, we're kind of just at the cusp of completing the first phase of that. And then the next, the next thing that you have to focus on is actually putting together the environmental statement and getting another arm of government called the Offshore Petroleum Regulator for Environment and Decommissioning. Snappy. Snappy, upread for short, <laughs> to approve the environmental statement. But actually, you're best doing that once you know which vessel you're using. So there's a, there's a time frame for all these things. So probably the most important thing to, for us to do in the first quarter is first, second quarter, settle which vessel we're using. And then uh, we'll be putting together the environmental statement. And at a certain point in that process, we'll want to kick off the feed uh, for the FPSO and for the platforms and so on and so forth. Brilliant. Well, let's see. What, what, what I'm hearing from you is being there, done it before, got the people around us to help deliver it, confident about what we've got and the technology we're going to use and the process we're going to um, uh, uh, utilize during the next X period. And I appreciate you don't want to dive in and, and give dates a wise move, um, but come on a journey with us is, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, today, if you if you took our market cap and divided it by the combined 2P and 2C resources we have, it's something like 20 cents a barrel. That's crazy. That's, I mean, that's a, that's a crazy number. It is. <laughs> what can I say? What can I say? Um, well, look, Steve, look, I appreciate you coming on the show and talking to us. I mean, I'm, I'm going to spend a lot of your time, utilized a lot of your time. Stay in touch and uh, keep us abreast of what, how things are moving forward. I'm intrigued by the way you're going about it. Uh, and as a fellow countryman, I'm, I'm uh, excited for you. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure talking with you, Matt.